the because today is an international day of prayer for the persecuted church. We want to recognize something. And I, I said to Claire this morning, I said, I'll be honest with you, it's aspects of, of communion today are sad because as we remember the persecuted church, it's a recognition that some Christians struggle because people persecute them push down against them, push back against them in their faith. But more, we live in a world where churches are being burned, where not only are Christians told not to express their faith, but many Christians, many Christians in our world today go to their deaths for their faith. And so as we come to this table, as we take bread and wine together, I want us to remember that we do so in a freedom that our brothers and sisters, even today, don't have. Today, in our world, some Christians will die for Jesus. And that's sobering. Now, look, when the table first um, came, it, it was because Jesus taught his disciples. But as he called them, they didn't know who he was. They didn't know what God would be doing. And there came a point when he said to, to them and to the crowds, to follow me is serious. To follow me is challenging. If you want to follow me, you may have to give up so many things. And the Bible tells us that many people left him at that point. Many people fled. Many people walked away and said, this is too much. And he says to the disciples, what about you? Will you go? And they say this, words that, that come back to me quite often. They say, no, Lord, only you have the words of life. So as we come to this table today, we come into the one who holds the words of life and who has called us, enabled us to live for him. Now, Jesus, after instituting the table, after giving us this family meal, he goes to his death on the cross. And we know that the Bible says, and we know this in our hearts, many of us, because we've experienced it, that Jesus takes away the sins of the world. The, dis the disciples, even at that point, don't understand, do they, when he dies? Most of them run away in panic. Peter, who said he would never, even if the others ran away. He denies him and flees and goes in his guilt away. But Jesus dies on the cross to take away the sins of the world. And then the Bible tells us on the third day, he's resurrected. He promises then that the disciples in time will receive the Holy Spirit. They will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is not an optional extra. This is very God with us. And the disciples don't know what that means. But in that time, after the first communion, after they saw Jesus, I should imagine they took the bread and the wine daily. But they kept, as they said, gathering, praying and saying, Lord, come. And this was their big connection. And as we remember it today, let's remember how important it was to them and how important it is for us. We generally only take communion once a month in church. Some Christians take it more often, but this is a powerful meal and we're told never to take of it lightly, never to take of it without confessing our sins, without recognizing the depths of it. In time at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is given to the disciples and acts as a book after the Gospels tells us, they began to suffer. They began to suffer for talking about Jesus. Now, this was real suffering, not sometimes. Sometimes we talk about suffering for our faith in the UK in a very light manner. We talk about it in a way where we talk about persecution. I don't think persecution happens as often as it is maybe talked about in the church in the UK, but it, it does happen. But 
they began to really suffer. They witnessed to people. They were threatened. They spoke about Jesus. They were beaten. They soon saw, as they looked at their brother Stephen, that it cost one of their number their lives. That was real suffering. But they had revelation, Acts tells us. When they were mistreated, when they were beaten, when they were persecuted, Acts tells us that they rejoiced. Now, one of the things, I'm not going to read them, but one of the things you see in so many places in the modern church where persecution happens is that those Christians are rejoicing. And they rejoiced like the disciples did because the disciples realized that they, Acts uses these words, that they were worthy of the name of Jesus so that they stood up and they spoke for him and the threats of death and the persecution made them realize that they were really following Jesus. And it's like Jesus said in John's gospel, you see how they're going to treat the master and some of you, the followers, you will have the same treatment. So today, from a place of calm and peace and freedom, we recognize that we are in a world where the church is persecuted, where Christians are threatened, abused, stifled. And unlike Jesus, who before his persecutors was quiet, the disciples and Christians today don't back away under persecution. They speak and they speak loudly. And the spiritual opposition that they face reminds them that the promises of Jesus are true. Look at the table here. We're going to sing a couple more songs of worship in a minute, but look at that table. It's simple. I'm going to uncover it. It has bread. We use gluten-free bread so everybody can take part in it. It has wine. We don't use alcoholic wine because not everyone drinks and some of us have had difficult relationships with alcohol anyway. But this table with these elements represents the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And it's simple. But all that Jesus did for us that day when he died for us was not simple. It was everything. And so regard this table well recognize the sacrifice of Jesus for you. Um, think of this scripture. This is one from John's letter. This is how we know what love is, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we must lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. We're going to sing again. I'm going to sing you laid aside your majesty and it's on page one at the beginning of our song books I want us to look from the present of the table to back to what the scriptures say only a little bit but about the purpose of the table and the spiritual reality of the table. I'm going to read a few verses from Hebrews chapter 9. When Jesus Christ came as the high priest of the good things that have come, then he went to the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, 
but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of ashes of a heifer sanctifies those who were defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Jesus Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will this purify our conscience from dead works in order that we would worship the living God? Sometimes since we looked at the book of Hebrews, but Hebrews 9 reminds us that through his death, Jesus goes to the heavenly temple, the heavenly place, which the earthly temples were just a copy of, just a pale imitation of what he, where he would go, that his offering for our freedom would be full. So we come to this table, and it's for everybody who loves the Lord Jesus. It's for all of his brothers and sisters. And in John's gospel, Jesus told the crowds, I am the bread of life. Jesus made this table. And this is what he did in Mark 14. When it was evening, he came to the upper room with the 12. And when they'd taken their places and they were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating here with me. And they began to be distressed by this and said to him one after the other, surely not I. And he said to them, it's one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the son of man goes as is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them and said, take this. This is my body. Somebody's going to come and pray for the bread. It's John. And if it, if it helps... Dave's going to pray for the wine in a while. <laughs> Just so we're sure. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. They say timing is everything. Can you turn it Hello? off, Paul? Paul, can you turn it off? I can't, John. Can you do it, please? Yeah. Can you find out who it is? Sorry, Sorry it's okay. It's okay. Not a problem, Don't worry. We want to say thank you, Lord, for the gift of life, the life that comes through your broken body. We thank you that we, through faith, can enter into life eternal, that we can be with you forever. We thank you, our brother Jesus, for this gift that you've given us. And we just ask you now to bless us in your holy name. Amen. 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 So the table is before us and the body of Jesus Christ is broken, as we said. And Dave and John are going to come and serve us. And if you know the Lord a little and you want to love him more, this table's for you. So you might take the bread and share of the cup.
Then Jesus took a cup. And after giving thanks, he gave the cup to them. All of them drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. Lord, as we focus on your death on the cross, as we partake of these emblems we recognize that you yourself was part of a subjugated people but even worse it was those very people that persecuted you almost like a double whammy <coughs> and then as you as you hung there lord you looked down and saw those soldiers separating and gambling over your clothes and you uttered those words father forgive them for they know not what they do so humbly we come before you this morning and we pray lord that as we receive this wine we recognize your blood which was shed for the sins of the whole world is efficacious for us today and we can renew our vows of commitment to you and accept that forgiveness that continues to flow down through the centuries mm. that we who are sinners are saved through not anything we did ourselves but through that work of jesus christ lord we just are so grateful mm. Amen. Oh, Amen. Amen. So we'll take the cup and just hold on to it until everybody has, has a cup and then we can share together in just a reminder of our unity. We have the cup before us and I just want you just to look at it. Look at your cup. This week I've been doing a meditation each day, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the evening. And one day I was invited to imagine Jesus standing there with me. And as he stood there with me, I was to pass him my burdens. He's here with us. If you're sitting down now with your cup before you and there's a burden there for you, pass it to him. Let go of it. Pass it to him. 
He went to his death to set you free. Pass the burden of your sin, your worry, perhaps your shame, your guilt. Pass it to him. Recognize that in the breaking of his body and in the spilling of his blood, he came that you might be free. And whoever the Lord sets free is free indeed. So let us drink this cup together, not burdened, not still caught in problems of the past, but in freedom. Let us drink together. Blood of Jesus Christ shed for us. I'm going to read some more from Hebrews 9, just as we're in this place around the table. Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy, but went to heaven and appeared in the presence of God on our behalf. He didn't go to offer himself again and again as high priests did. No. Otherwise, he would have suffered again and again. But he appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to remove our sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that, go to the judgment. So Christ, have, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will return a second time, not then to deal with sin. But he will come back to save those who eagerly await him. I asked you a second ago to look at your cup. I want you to engage another sense right now. That too. I want you to smell. Smell the bread that you've taken and the wine that you've drunk on your breath. I want you to taste on your tongue the lingering flavors of these emblems, these elements. Recognize right now that what's gone in you represents the body of Jesus broken for us, the blood of Jesus shed for us. That we take these elements to recognize that we are connected to Jesus in our walk right now. More still, having taken bread and wine to connect ourselves to Jesus. This also connects us to God's children across our world. Right now, other Christians are taking bread and wine. Some have done so gladly, some in suffering. I find this really hard to say. As we've sat here in 35 minutes, some Christians have died in our world. And on this International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, it's right we recognize this. Last Sunday, we were told that Vera had died and gone to be with the Lord. She's fallen asleep. Some Christians have died in a natural way, but others, even in this hour, have had their lives taken away from them. We understand today that as many as 159,000 
Christians die a year in our world. That means that in an hour where we come together for the table, 18 Christians might die for being bold enough to express their faith in Jesus. So look at that table again. As well as connecting us to Jesus, our table reminds us of what the scriptures say, that Jesus went to the heavenly sanctuary to offer himself once for the sins of the world, to stop that separation, to make it so that men and women through all of time may go to heaven to be with him forever. And in Revelation chapter six, there's a picture of this altar in heaven. And John speaks about the martyr church. He speaks about the brave souls of those who saw the coming victory of Jesus. And I'm gonna read just a few verses of Revelation six. Verse nine says, when he broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all those who'd been slaughtered for the word of God and for the testimony they had given. And they cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge and avenge, the brother, avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? Each of them were given a white robe and told to rest a little while longer until the number would be complete, both of their fellow servants and of their brothers and sisters who were soon to be killed just as they had been killed. I told you there were some pieces of paper on your seats. If you haven't got one, please find one. If there are pieces of paper without um, somebody owning them, grab them too, because um, I'd like us to read the names of these countries. And that means you're going to be speaking. But um, praise the Lord if you've got an easy one to say. Apologies if it's not so easy. But there's no order. There's no thing. I just want these names of these countries read out, please. And we're going to We'll do that together. So um, it doesn't matter if they're read at the same time. God can hear multiple things. So I'm going to say mine first. Uzbekistan. Myanmar. Laos. Laos. India. Is that all of them? Kuwait, not because I knew Kuwait was missing. Have we said them all? There are on those chairs amongst you, the names of the 50 most difficult places to be a Christian in our world today. It doesn't mean that the other 300 and something countries in the world are easy but those are the places that have the greatest number of difficulties. Now, some, who read Nigeria? Nigeria. Nigeria is the place currently where most Christians are killed each year. Over three and a half thousand, which is 10 a day. And just to be even more sobering, I told Andrew that parts of this service are a tad depressing, 
But we, we should remember what's going on in our world. As you read those names, as I read that scripture before them, even in that time, somewhere in our world, a Christian was killed for their faith. In those three minutes, because that's what it averages out to. And that is not, in terms of the fact that we sit here in freedom, that is not something we should be guilty about. You should not feel guilty because you were in a country where you are highly unlikely to get shot for being a practicing Christian. But it is sobering and it does demand our prayer, our support, and the recognition that we can speak for Jesus without the threat of the danger and we should speak for Jesus. My favorite story of so many was a story of a family um, in China that were arrested for being Christians and they took all of them from the youngest to the oldest and they were tormenting them in, in a prison and one of the children realized and they said to their, their parents they're trying to make me cry aren't they because they want me to say I don't love Jesus and this kid said I will keep saying I love Jesus and I will not give them the satisfaction of seeing me cry and even this child knew how precious her faith in Jesus was churches are burned churches are destroyed and Christians are hurt and killed and I commend to you if you don't know them organizations like Christian Solidarity Worldwide and Open Doors. They are very good at helping us in our freedoms to learn more about the suffering church today. So, part of me thinks an International Day of Prayer is silly because it's good to remember on a day our suffering family but it's silly in my head if we pray today and then don't bother for the 364 days of the rest of the year take your piece of paper home if you've got one and pray for that country take a chance to go and find out more about what open doors do even though brother andrew their founder died just a couple of weeks ago um Open Doors will continue to help the persecuted church be spoken about and to help work in it. So will Christian Solidarity Worldwide. I want to read a prayer for the suffering church. And after that, we're going to sing together. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are in prison today. We pray for those who stand against injustice. We pray for those who stand up for the truth that you are God. Lord, we pray for Christians who have disappeared in so many countries who are persecuted. We pray, Lord, for Christians in our world today who are undergoing torture. Some, as we sit here, Lord, recovering from being tortured to recant their faith. Lord God, give them the strength and the sense that they are not alone. Be near them by your Holy Spirit. Empower them as we pray for them. Help them, Lord. Help them, Lord, to stand strong for you. Lord, we pray for the people who are doing that torture, Lord. You've told us that the battle is not against people, but against spiritual powers and principalities and all that stands in opposition to you. Lord, may those persecutors see in the stands of faith who you are. Lord, for Christians 
who have been in prison for a long time, who feel forgotten. Lord, we pray that you would help us to remember them. And if there's anything we can do through lobbying, through writing letters, through something practical, help us to take a stand, Lord, because you said whatever we do for the least of these, we do for you. And Lord, I think it's it's a disgrace to call them the least. Because, Lord, though they've been disempowered and taken away, they're not the least. They are phenomenal, Lord. The fact that they hold to you when people want to take everything away from them. We praise your name for them. Lord Jesus, you know exactly what it's like to be arrested and taken away without true charge. You know exactly what it's like to be beaten, mocked, insulted, and tortured for trusting in Father God. Lord, be with them now and hold them, Lord, in your wounded hands. And be with us, Lord, that when we have moments where we're faced with the choice to say yes, that we don't do what Peter did and say, I don't know him. Be with us that we might stand up for our faith, whatever the days bring. Be with your children all over the world, whatever steps they take today. Amen. Amen.